Hey everyone, welcome to the very first episode of Quantum News Monthly, a show where we talk about the latest and greatest in the world of quantum information science. I'm your host, Devo. And I'm your co-host, Mingyu. As grad students working in quantum computing research, it's a really exciting time to witness the field progressing so fast. But it's a lot to keep up with, and there's a lot of misinformation and hype going out there. So we wanted to create this show to talk about some of the exciting stuff that have happened in the world of quantum information uh, research every month and talk to you about why we f uh, find certain uh, studies and breakthroughs really exciting and what that means for the field in general. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about how this quantum dot chessboard might be a leap in scaling soup semiconductor quantum devices. And second, could the new codes called quantum LDPC codes be replacing surface code in terms of error correction? And does entanglement fundamentally look like yin and yang? The answer is no, by the way. And we're going to talk about what the popular science media is getting wrong about this. But first, a quick shout out to Kachin and Joe who helped with the research and to Chris who's behind the camera. Now, without further ado, let's move on to the quantum dot chessboard. Of all quantum computing technologies that are currently in the quantum race, quantum dots are probably the most similar to transistors that we find in microchip processors. At its core, a quantum dot is a semiconductor-based device that confines single or few electrons at a site for quantum operations. The electron spin states makes for good qubits. And then you can implement two qubit gates between electrons based on the Pauli exclusion principle. Because as we know, Pauli exclusion principle applies to electrons, which means that no two electrons can be in the same site and the same spin state. Then what are the advantages of quantum dot in quantum technology? Right, so since quantum dots are very similar to uh, semiconductor devices that we already have, it means that it has a backing of silicon industry and photolithography techniques. Plus, electron spins also make for uh, really high coherent states in principle. Hopefully, we'll get there quicker now. Because in this paper, a team of scientists from TU Delft showed a way to scale that could change things. So typically, a quantum computer will have as many uh, control lines as there are qubits. For example, a superconducting quantum computer will have as many microwave cables as there are transmont qubits. Um, and this makes it challenging to route so many cables when you have 100 plus qubits, for example. So can things be different for quantum dots? Right, that's exactly what this group tried to do. Um, typically, quantum dot devices have electron confinement sites in a line. And what the Delft team tried here is to build a two-dimensional grid of quantum dots. Um, and in their device, they have four by four grid of 16 quantum dots that they can control with voltage lines going from the top and left sides. And what they're claiming is that when you do things this way, you can control a number of qubits that scales with the area of this grid using a number of lines that is only proportional to the perimeter of this grid. So that means that you could control up to millions of qubits with only thousands of control lines. A lot of pop science articles have compared this to a chessboard. And if you look at their device, it does kind of look like a chessboard, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so kind of like how you define a position in chess by using a letter and a number, you can control a specific qubit on this chessboard style quantum device by applying voltages to the top and left lines. And they showed that they can populate the device with electron spins, and they can selectively tune the voltages applied to the layers to do a gate between qubits and two sides while all the other pairs are non-interacting. Oh, that means that they can do individual two qubit gates. Right, yeah. And this is really cool. It is definitely a big leap forward for quantum dot technology. It'll probably be complex to compute what all these voltages need to be to do gates on devices that need a uh, thousand qubits. Uh, but it's something that can be calibrated and figured out. And hey, this is really exciting. Um, I think it'll be really cool to see how industry adopts this technology and what qubit fidelities look like when we get to thousands of qubits using this. Um, yeah, it's an exciting time to uh, be in quantum. Um, all right, so on to error correction, right? Yeah. Now let's talk about the second big piece of uh, monthly quantum news, which is on quantum error correction. So uh, when it comes to today's quantum computers, qubits are fragile and quantum gates sometimes have errors. So along with efforts in trying to make better qubits and better gates, we also need to do quantum error correction. So what we do is we take one quantum bit of information and spread it out among a large entangled state of uh, many qubits. 
For example, you can use uh, nine physical qubits that are entangled to store one quantum bit, and that's what we, uh, what we are going to call a logical qubit. So this way, even if error occurs on one of the physical qubits, you can listen to what other physical qubits say and uh, correct the error on one of the qubits. So this, there's a ratio between the number of logical qubits to the number of physical qubits, and this tells you how efficient your code will be in terms of the total number of physical qubits. And this is what we're going to call the code rate. Cool, cool. Yeah, that's cool. But usually when you add more qubits to a device, you end up with more errors on your device, right? That's right. That's right. So this idea of using more qubits to uh, correct more errors works only when your physical error rate is lower than a certain rate. And this is what we call the threshold. This threshold is important as, we, as this sets a target for what the physical error rate should be in actual experimental hardware to do quantum error correction. So error correcting codes with higher thresholds is definitely what we want. And surface code is an example of quantum error correcting code, which has been studied heavily for the last two decades. And there are two nice features of this. The first is that surface code only requires two qubit gates between the nearest neighbors. And that's great for, for example, superconducting qubits, because you don't need like complicated wires to connect faraway qubits. And the second nice feature of surface code is that it has a very high threshold, which is about 1%. And this is why Google, ETH Zurich, and USTC of China could run uh, nice surface code experiments and demonstrate some quantum error correction, although they don't have like super high gate fidelities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it seems like surface codes are really cool and really sure. great. Yeah. Um, so why are people trying to replace these surface codes with uh, these newer uh, codes? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's because surface code is quite bad in terms of the code rate, mm -hmm. which is, again, the ratio of the number of logical qubits to the number of physical qubits. Basically, if you want to get to really, really small logical errors so that you can run really long computations, uh, then your code rate will go to almost zero. That's why people estimated that you would need 20 million physical qubits to run surface code and, for example, break cryptography. And 20 million is a big number. Yeah. So for the past three years or so, there has been great progress in what people call QLDPC codes, or quantum low density parity check codes. And the key thing here is that the code rate can be non-zero, for example, 1 over 24. Hmm. So the upside is that QLDPC codes can be pretty efficient in terms of the number of physical qubits, but the downside is that they would have to go beyond the nearest neighbor connections. So for superconducting qubits, the LDPC codes would need the long wires that connect faraway qubits. Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So what did we learn about LDPC codes this month? Yeah, so there were actually two very good papers uh, that I will introduce today. The first paper was by IBM, and the authors here found a new set of QLDPC codes and designed a protocol for doing quantum error correction and preserved the uh, logical qubit. So they simulated the entire protocol and estimated that the threshold would be about 0.8%. Hmm. That is, if you have gate with errors lower than 0.8%, you can do some quantum error correction. Hmm. So uh, remind that the surface code had a threshold of about 1%. So it's comparable to that, and it gives a lot of hope. Mm -hmm. Also, they compared the number of physical qubits that uh, needs to be used. For the case of having 12 logical qubits and having a physical error rate of about 0.1%, uh, their LDPC codes would need 288 physical qubits. While to do the same for the surface code, they will need 4,000 physical qubits. Wow. So that's a lot of savings. And what's more, they also provide a layout for running these codes on two planes of qubits, which could be probably doable with superconducting qubits. But of course, they would need long-range connections anyway. Uh, they have to solve in the future. Wow, that's a, that's a lot. Yeah, but that's not all for this month, actually. There is another paper, a collaboration between UChicago, Harvard Caltech, and University of Arizona. And what they did here is they showed how to do computation efficiently using LDPC codes in the Rydberg Atom platform. So now we're talking about a different platform. And here, the long-range connections are not actually a problem because these atoms, they can physically move around to you know, connect to the other qubits. 
Mm. So the authors suggest using the quantum LDPC code as a memory block. And then they pull the quantum information whenever they need to transfer to the surface code. Uh, we're transferring to surface code because we know how to do computation on the surface code really well. Hmm. And although we use these surface codes, uh, we still wouldn't need too many physical qubits because the computation part is done only on a few qubits at a time. So the authors here use two new QLTPC codes to simulate their protocols. And it seems that uh, only using a few thousand Rydberg atom qubits, they can have a few hundred logical qubits perform various logical gates, and still suppress errors. So again, there's a lot of savings compared to using only the surface code. Mm -hmm. So people have been thinking about whether we can actually run these nice quantum LDPC codes on hardware. And of course, it's not something we can immediately do. Uh, Supercutting the qubits would require long-range connections. And with Berg atoms, they would need a few thousand qubits, which is certainly beyond, uh, certainly on their target but not immediately. So these definitely look like exciting progress and gives a lot of hope that perhaps in a few years we might see very cool quantum LDPC code experiments. Yeah, yeah, that, that is awesome. That's, a, that's a, quite a few breakthroughs in the error correction world. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, by the way, um, we did film a short uh, video explaining error correction in more detail. So if you're interested in seeing that, definitely subscribe to the channel and stay tuned. Now, on to our final science result this yin and yang symbol that's been going around the internet. Many pop science articles are claiming that this is a picture of quantum entanglement itself. And then people on TikTok, TikTok picked up on it and started connecting it to um, spirituality. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, this has all stemmed from a big misunderstanding. And hopefully we'll clear this up. Um, because while the scientists aren't visualizing quantum entangled photons per se, what they've done here is still really impressive and worth talking about. So let's start by breaking down the keywords in the title of this paper. Biphoton states really means that you're using two entangled photons. And then interferometric imaging, which is a mouthful, really refers to this technique that they've used in this study. And I'll explain that. Interferometry, by the way, is a pretty common technique that's used in many areas. For example, we use it in our lab to measure our laser wavelengths to really high precision. And then LIGO uses it to measure gravitational waves with incredible sensitivity. Interferometry basically splits light from one source into two paths and then superimposes the paths to give interference. That is, if the peaks line up with the peaks, then they add an amplitude. And if the peaks line up with the troughs, then they cancel. You can probably see how this technique can be used to get amplitude and phase information of light if you know the information of one of the paths and the other path is unknown. So what did the scientists do here, here in this paper using interferometry? Right, so we know that photons are very important in quantum information science because they can be easily produced and controlled. And you can store information in several degrees of freedom in photons, such as their polarization, time bins, temporal modes, orbital angular momentum, et cetera, et cetera. This makes them suitable to encode large amounts of quantum information in fewer photons, which also means that they are suitable as qubits, qubits, which are separate from qubits, right? Because qubits are two-level systems, and you can have, in this paper, up to 11-level systems, mm -hmm. um, as we'll see. Now, there is still a catch. And that, that catch is basically that getting all that information out from photons has not been very efficient because you need many, many measurements to fully characterize your quantum information for all those degrees of freedom. This characterization is called tomography in our field. In fact, the number of measurements needed scales as the square of the number of degrees of freedom. So if you have like 11 degrees of freedom, this number grows really, really large. So you kind of lose the benefit of these extra degrees of freedom that are available to you with photons. Huh, so let me guess, this is where the interferometry comes in. <laughs> right, exactly. The authors of this paper use entangled photon pairs and interferometry to greatly improve the efficiency of photon state tomography. Mm -hmm. For example, they were able to use the scheme to fully characterize the photon states for 11 degrees of freedom in a matter of just minutes instead of what used to take days. 
which is three orders of magnitude improvement. Now to the really interesting part. They use a test picture, which just happens to be a yin and yang symbol. And you can see this test picture in the small box here. Using their method, they successfully reconstructed that picture, and the reconstructed image is here shown on the right. But this is not a visualization of entanglement itself. That's right, it's just a test picture. Right, exactly. And oh. they were able to do this successfully, which means that their technique works, and this is still a great improvement to techniques used to uh, decode information stored in photons. So this is a big leap, mm -hmm. but it's not visualizing entanglement itself. Oh man, you saved me. I thought entanglement was definitely something like yin and yang. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're funny. <laughs> but yeah, hopefully we were able to clear up the confusion. And you can also watch um, Anton Petrov, uh, who made a really great video explaining this specifically on YouTube. Um, All right, so that was the latest and greatest in quantum this September. And peace out. See you next month. <laughs>